YouTube. My name is Natalie. I'm a criminal defense attorney. Welcome to my channel. And today is the first video in my series known as Spooky Season. This will be one video per week for the month of October that involves true crime with a spooky twist. Our first video was going to be about the Salem witch trials. Now, you would think this wouldn't really fall under true crime because the people that were convicted of committing crimes hadn't actually done anything, but the crimes that were committed were those that were committed by the state. We're gonna talk about how the Salem witch trials influenced the justice system that we have today. Uh, so back in 1692 in Salem, Massachusetts, the colonies were going through a weird time. Uh, the monarchs, William and Mary, out of good old jolly England, uh, were running a war against the French. You know, England and France had been going through it for quite some time. Like they had a bunch of land disputes. They were both trying to encroach into the Americas. So the colonists, those were the people that would eventually become the Americans in 1692 they were really financially struggling as a result of the displacement that happened from Britain's war with the French, causing people that were living in Canada to move down into the colony of Massachusetts, some of them settling in Salem. Now, the people that lived in Salem, they had their own issues, aside from the people now coming into their territory and taking up their resources, which is how they saw it. Uh, they had a uh, conflict between those that lived the more agricultural lifestyle and those that were more of the bourgeoisie class who lived from trade in the ports. But one thing that everyone had in common was a belief in the supernatural. So they believed very strongly in God and the devil and the devil's ability to impact what people do here on earth. In fact, they believed that the devil could make pacts with people to give them extra powers as long as they signed over their souls to the devil. That may sound like an outdated belief system to some, but as you'll see in later videos, this type of satanic panic really began in the Salem witch trials era around 1692. Never mind the fact that witch hunts were a thing that actually did happen in Europe back into the 1300s. So it was nothing new to Europeans to hunt people and declare, and women in particular, and declare that they were witches. They brought that behavior over with them into the colonies. In addition, a smallpox epidemic had just ravaged through the colonies, leaving many people financially insecure and looking for something supernatural to explain the misfortune that had been befalling them kind of what we see today with a certain pandemic that's taken over this country. So in January 1692, nine-year-old Elizabeth, also known as Betty Paris, and 11-year-old Abigail Williams, the daughter and niece of Samuel Paris, a minister of Salem Village, began having these violent fits. Uh, now, they were contortions, uncontrollable yelling and screaming, as well as outbursts. This started to draw the attention of other people. They were taken to a local doctor known as William Griggs, and he diagnosed them with bewitchment. At that time, to be bewitched meant that you had been taken over by some type of evil spirit at the behest of someone that served the devil. Now, after these young girls were diagnosed with bewitchment, other young girls began to join in on the symptoms as well of having violent fits and outbursts. Those young girls were Ann Putnam Jr., Mercy Lewis, Elizabeth Hubbard, Mary Walcott, and Mary Warren. These girls began to make accusations that they had been bewitched by the Paris family slave to tuba. Now, let's just take a minute for this because every single time people talk about the Salem witch trials, they kind of gloss over the fact that the first person accused of being a witch in Salem was a 
slave from the Caribbean by the name of Tatuba, a black woman who was just minding her business, didn't even want to be there, held against her will, and now the little white girls want to throw a fit, and now it's the slave's fault. But Tatuba turned one back on them, okay? So they arrested Tatuba and two other women, Sarah Osborne and Sarah Good. Sarah Good was a homeless woman, poor thing, and Sarah Osborne was just an elderly lady who was minding her business. Now, Sarah Osborne and Sarah Good, you know, they did what most people would do. They denied it. They said, I didn't do anything. I am not a witch. <laughs> Isn't there a politician who said she wasn't a witch? Anyway, I am not a witch and I didn't do it. I didn't bewitch these young girls. But Tatuva, she knew how to survive, thinking that, you know, I'll get the heat off of myself if I turn it back on somebody else. Tatuva said, yeah, you're right. I am a witch. I did make a pact with the devil. She said that the devil had shown her all these wondrous things. And then this black man came and gave her a book and told her to sign it. And so she signed the book and put her uh, name in the devil's book. And then she was able to bewitch uh, the daughters, of, the daughter and niece of the minister known as Paris. That was only one version of events. Another version, as told by Tatuba herself to a historian, uh, Tatuba was actually beaten by the minister Paris um, into confessing to bewitching the girls when the girls started having their fits and acting crazy. Um, he uh, beat her, made her confess. She was in prison for over a year. He refused to pay her bail. She recanted her story while she was imprisoned and then somewhat anonymously paid to have her released. And from there, little is known about what happened to her. And just a bit on her background, she's originally from Barbados. That's where Paris got her from or bought her from, where she was in, kidnapped and enslaved from. And she was believed to be an indigenous person, a Carib person. So indigenous to the Caribbean, not a person that was brought here by the transatlantic slave trade. Um, either way, she was held as a slave. And she was a teenager at the time of the Salem witch trials, even though she's often depicted as an old woman. So Homegirl pointed to other people that were witches and she and Sarah Good and Sarah Osborne were put in jail. From there, panic quickly consumed the entire Salem area. The three accused witches were brought before magistrates Jonathan Corwin and John Hawthorne. They were questioned. But when they were questioned, it was done in public and all the girls who said that they had been bewitched put on a show in front of the entire community and started having spasms and fits and throwing themselves on the ground and going into contortions and screaming and pointing out to Tuba and saying that she had uh, bewitched them as well as the two Sarahs. The other people accused of being witches were Martha Corey and Rebecca Nurse, and they were seen as upstanding members of the church and community. In addition, the four-year-old daughter of one of the original accused, the four-year-old daughter of Sarah Good, was also accused of being a witch. A, a, a baby, a straight-up baby, was accused of being a witch. They said because she was hesitating while answering her questions, they saw that as a confession. Of course, she was hesitating. She was four. She was a baby. She didn't know what was happening. Now, several of those accused witches picked up what Tatuba was putting down. They figured out that if they confessed to being a witch, which is what they wanted to hear anyway, and pointed out other people, they fared better than those that denied it. So some people started pointing to other women and calling them witches as well. William Phipps was appointed as the new governor. William Phipps was appointed as the new governor of Massachusetts in May of 1692. And he ordered the establishment of a special court to oversee these witch trials known as the court of Oyer and Terminate. It could be Oye because when the Supreme Court opens, they say Oye, 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 but it's spelled differently. So I'm not quite sure how that's pronounced, but it's the special court of Oye, which is to hear and Terminate, which is to decide. Um, and that was based in Suffolk, Essex and Middlesex County and it was to determine specifically witchcraft cases. 
Um, the judges that were uh, over these trials were Hawthorne, uh, Samuel Sewell, and William Stoughton. The first person ever convicted of being a witch was Bridget Bishop. And on June 2nd, 1692, so only a month after the court had been established, Bridget was hanged um, eight days after her conviction. And the area she was hanged at would be known as Gallows Hill. Many more people, 18 in total, would go on to be executed for being witches, all of them women. And a man was crushed to death, a 72-year-old man was crushed to death for refusing uh, to admit to his role in procuring his wife to become a witch or whatever. So it was disgusting. Some of the evidence that the courts allowed to be heard was known as spectral evidence. So testimony of things that were really unable to be substantiated by anybody other than the person that was testifying. So spectral evidence was testimony in which witnesses claimed that the accused appeared to them and did them harm in a dream or a vision. So it held at the time that witches could project themselves spiritually, either directly or with the aid of Satan, in order to harm their victims from afar. The witch's victims might then see a spectral image of the witch approach them as an apparition. The specter of the witch could pinch, bite, or choke its victims or otherwise harass them while the witch remained in a remote location. So this was a way to accuse people of committing crimes, basically harassing and assaulting people while people were clearly in other places. So you could convict someone of being a witch by saying that I know that, you know, she was home at the time, but she uh, projected herself and caused me harm. This panic and um, hysteria went on for an entire year. But the people that were conducting these trials were not without opposition. It's not like there were men, because, you know, that's all they would have listened to anyway. It's not like there weren't men that were, you know, respected, that were telling them, this is not a good idea, let's not do this. A respected minister known as Cotton Mather wrote to the court and told them that they should not accept this spectral evidence. Um, but he was basically ignored. His father increased Mather, which is just a hilarious name, like Increase Mather. That is so funny. Increase Mather, who was the president of Harvard College and also Cotton Mather's father, basically wrote them again. It was like, no, Cotton's right. Listen to my son. It is better that a hundred witches go free than to wrongfully kill an innocent person. So eventually the tide started turning against the people that were making accusations that all these women were witches, in particular because I think that they started flying a little bit too close to the sun. They were really starting to accuse women who were upstanding members of society, married to really important people. And it just seemed very convenient that all of these God-fearing women all of a sudden were witches. So people were starting to get very skeptical of it. So eventually the court of Oye and Termine was disbanded and the head judge that presided over it did eventually apologize for his role and say that he was wrong for it. This is after they had already taken out 18 women. In January of 1697, the Massachusetts General Court declared a day of fasting for the tragedy of the Salem witch trials. And in 1711, some of the descendants were given compensation for the unlawful trial and execution of their forefathers. So their heirs were eventually paid in 1711. Later on in the 20th century, that's when Massachusetts would officially apologize for the Salem witch trials. Like the state of Massachusetts actually apologized for it. So what can we learn from the Salem witch trials that kind of still resonates today? First of all, you know, testimony without some form of corroboration should always be looked at skeptically. That kind of informed our decision to not accept that type of uh, evidence when this country was formed. We formed a constitution and the constitution obviously would have been violated by a lot of the things that happened at the Salem witch trials.
In addition, we also learn from the Salem Witch Trials that what's popular isn't always what's true. It's known in the law as the tyranny of the majority. Um, so just because the majority of people for a brief second lost their minds and believed that, you know, Satan was taking over all these women and these women were all witches, doesn't mean that that's actually what was happening. What you really had was mass hysteria by the public. In the 1950s, Arthur Miller would write The Crucible, retelling the Salem Witch Trials events, but for the purpose of pointing out the civil rights violations that were occurring as a result of the McCarthy trials, where they were trying to root out communists. That type of panic was seen again in the 1980s and 1990s with satanic panic and with the QAnon conspiracy that we see today. One would even say that QAnon is just an extension of the satanic panic. All of that leads us as a society to think about uh, critically looking at allegations that arise from supernatural means. The Salem witch trials inform many things about how we form the criminal justice system that are still relevant today. Mass hysteria should always be accounted for when making allegations against anyone. The second thing that I think is very important that came out of the Salem witch trials is to be very careful when relying on evidence that's provided by children. We saw this issue from the Salem witch trials to the 1980s and 1990s satanic panic all the way till today. Children witnesses are unreliable and many of the witnesses that initially charged women with being witches were children who basically didn't understand the importance of what they were saying and the dangerousness of the allegations that they were making. When confessions come from things like torture and the fear of death, we should always be skeptical of those confessions. So for example, Tatuba's confession really came about because she had been held in a stockade and she knew that death was impending unless she turned someone else in. Coerced confessions are never reliable and can never be counted on. There's always the right to a speedy trial, but a rushed trial is never a good thing. Many of these women were, tr were accused, tried, convicted, and executed within a matter of weeks to months. That is not justice. There should always be time taken for the authorities to look into and think critically about what they're accusing someone of. Spectral evidence, although long discounted back in 1693, there are still vestiges of that today. Evidence should always be something that has some type of indicia of reliability. And that reliability cannot be your personal belief system. There has to be some way to outside verify that type of evidence. Even if it's just the oral testimony of one person, it has to have some type of indicia of reliability. And, you know, testimony that I saw someone fly in the air against the laws of physics is not evidence that should be introduced against anyone in order to charge or convict them. That may sound like an absolutely crazy thing. Like it may sound like, of course, Natalie, since 1692, no one's gonna do that. But I would point people to the 1990s trial of the McMartin Preschool. The McMartin Preschool is a great example of how that basically what we came to know as the satanic panic overtook what would be normally reasonable people and allowed them to accept evidence from children who were unreliable that their teachers were flying in the air and had composed underground tunnels to take them to be abused, that the teachers took them away in hot air balloons in order for them to be abused by people that worship Satan. All of these type of allegations were accepted by a so-called mentally sound and technologically advanced society. If we even look today to the QAnon conspiracy in which much of this same witch hunt rhetoric is used uh, by people all across the internet and that that informs how they behave with their neighbors and friends, we will see that that level of panic and belief in the supernatural does permeate right down into our criminal justice system today. So I think that there's a lot of things that we learn from that, what type of evidence to accept, what type of evidence not to accept. I would like to know what you guys think about the consequences that the Salem Witch Trials have in our criminal justice system today in the comment section down below, and I'll talk to you later. Bye. 
Thank you to our lawyer chicklets for helping to support this channel who are listed on the screen here. Have be spooky season.